I knew nothing about business. And then when I started learning about business, I was like, oh yeah, I know everything. I'm, I'm starting to know everything. And then you, you live as an owner every single day of your life. It's like chaos. There's always a fire. And then you realize you know nothing. And the more you learn, the more you realize you really do know nothing. Taking risks is something that needs to be learned. If you make changes, you make changes for the better, but hopefully it can't get any worse. Like, can it get any worse than being stuck in a practice that you work in seven days a week and you dread waking up in the morning and you go there and your instruments aren't sharp. And someone's like barking orders at you and there's another dental hygienist or dentist or assistant who's like your arch nemesis. Like, can it get any worse than that? And you know, there is one question that people don't ask and it's how are you really? Like your heart, your soul, your brain, your mental health. And I think that's one of the questions that we forget to ask one another because we're afraid of what the answer might be. Yeah, this is a tale, a tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one, bringing the best of dental knowledge. And we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening and preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, an Endeavor Business Media production. This is episode number 371. I'm your host, Andrew Johnston, and thank you so much for being with us today. I'm really excited. I have a special one for you. It feels really good to get this one out. We have Tooth Life Irene on the show, Irene Yanku, and she has had the most incredible career journey of almost anyone that I know. And we talk a little bit about that today. We talk about you know, where she's coming from and what she's gone through, the experiences and the growth that she's had. We talk about her being a practice owner. We talk about her being a restorative hygienist, all of the different things that we could think of. She kind of touches on a little bit today. But I think beyond that, one of the things that I wanted to talk to her about was I saw her at Voice of Dentistry and I saw her present and she just came across different. You can tell that there's there's been something that was, I don't want to say more serious because that's not really true. It was just, it was a little bit more, it was just different. I, I don't know how to describe it. But I do pretty much call her out on that in my first question. So I really hope that you guys enjoy this one and and learning about the different growth stages that she's gone through and how relatable it is that you know we're all going through stuff and doesn't matter who you are, there's always a way out. You just have to kind of keep at it. Uh, so that was it was a really good message. I'm really excited for you guys to hear this one today. Then next week we have on two guests from Sleep Better NYC. We have Teresa and Drew. Some of the most down to earth, nice human beings I've ever met. And the reason why I wanted to have them on is they're doing something that's a little bit unique. A lot of times when we have people on the show, you know, they're trying to talk to hygienists about how to be a hygienist and change the way that that you practice. And um, maybe it's, you know, bigger picture dentistry. And what these two people are trying to do is really bridge that gap for patients and help them get better sleep. So one of the things that they do that I really appreciate is that they will spend the time with the patients to explain what a diagnosis is. And I think it's unique. And so I'm really excited for you guys to hear that one too, because this is a resource that I think a lot of us could really use in our cities. So make sure that you don't miss this one by hitting that subscribe button. Please hit that subscribe button. Tell all of your friends about what a great show this one is. And then this week I will be at Chicago Midwinter and I'll definitely be recording somewhere. I'm not really sure. Usually it's uh, out in the hallway somewhere. You'll probably see me recording. If I don't have my headsets on, stop by, say hi, let's snap a photo because I would love to meet you. But we have lots of really great episodes lined up for the coming months that we're going to be recording there. And shout out because we have Erica Flateau coming back on. I got a lot of great feedback about her when she was helping me at RDH Under One Roof for all those episodes. And she's coming back on to help me interview, I think probably about another 10 or so guests. And I'm just, I'm really excited for it. So the recordings are all going to happen on Friday, Thursday, is AOSH Hot Topic. And if you don't know about this, make sure you look it up. I'll put a link in the show notes. If you happen to be in Chicago, you're free. You haven't finalized your plans for that Thursday of of doing courses at Midwinter. Consider this. Just like the name implies, it's Hot Topics, great speakers. They're only 20-minute presentations, so it's fast. It's boom, boom, done. It'll be my first year going, so I'm really excited about that. So if you're going to that, make sure you let me know. Andrew out of Tale of Two Hygienists, and I'll make sure that we have a chance to meet up. Before I get to the interview, I just want to, this is so random, but a huge shout out to Christina Rose, because 
she made me almost spit out my drink last week. She posted a photo in the Dental Hygiene Network Facebook group, and it was a treatment plan. Obviously, it was HIPAA compliant, but the treatment plan was for tooth number 19, and it was an all surfaces filling. It said, you know, in that one box was like tooth, and then there's the surfaces, and it's O-B-L-M-D, and her caption was, I feel like they spelled crown wrong, and I just died laughing. But also, it brought to my mind that we probably need to have an episode on this because there is a thing called biomimetics. And if you don't know what biomimetic dentistry is, I'm not sure how you're going to feel about this because for most of my career, I worked in a place that would do more biomimetic type restorations instead of defaulting to crowns for all surface fillings. So I, I laugh so hard, but also I'm like, holy crap, this is something we have to talk about. So hopefully that'll come in maybe mid-year or towards the end of the year if I can find someone that would speak on it. If you know someone that practices this way or can speak on it, please, please, please let me know. But I think that's it for me for this intro. I hope to see you at Chicago Midwinter. And if I don't, then I hope to see you at RDH Under One Roof. And with that, I hope you enjoy this episode with Irene Yanku. Tale of two All right, welcome everyone into the interview portion of the podcast. Really excited, long time in coming. Irene, you've been on the show before, but it's been years, I think, since your show has started, right? I've lived an entire life since the last time I was on your podcast. You have. Literally. I am like the phoenix that has risen from the ashes multiple times <laughs> since being here. So thank you for having Irene 3.0 back. That's exactly why I wanted you to be on. So this is what I wrote. Voice of Dentistry, you presented. Yep. And this is what I wrote as like something I was going to say as part of the intro. I said, because we were supposed to record there. So I said, Irene, you spoke earlier today about leadership. And if I can be honest, I heard it differently than who the person that you projected to be before. <sighs> that, How do you feel about that statement? That's a harsh statement. I didn't mean it to come out so harsh, but like it... You said 3.0. I mean, this is yeah. so many iterations of you. Yeah. You're not wrong. I really want to talk about that journey, though, because that sure. that's a thing that I think that we all, well, there's, there's imposter syndrome. I think that we try and project to be a certain person to further our career, further our relationship, do all these things. And really, we're trying to also balance like who exactly we really are on the inside. And I feel like watching you kind of from a distance, like you're, you're putting it all together in a way that I don't think a lot of people can. So right. do you mind talking a, a little bit like what you talked about at Voice of Dentistry, like your, your history, your story, <sighs> all of that? Oh, yes. So for those of you that don't know Voices of Dentistry, it's a, not a plug in any means, but it's a conference for podcasters where podcasters come together and we record content. Last year, I got to present on stage. We did a live recording. And then this year, Alan Mead, who also is a podcaster, said, you know, hey, do you want to talk about your journey in practice ownership? So I'm a dental hygienist here in the province of Ontario in Canada. And during COVID, I opened a startup and I knew nothing about business. And then when I started learning about business, I was like, oh, yeah, I know everything. I'm, I'm starting to know everything. And then you mm -hmm. you live as an owner every single day of your life, it's like chaos. There's always a fire. And then you realize you know nothing. And the more you learn, the more you realize you really do know nothing. And I don't think that there will ever be a moment as a business owner where I'll be 100% confident in my skills because you're constantly tiptoeing this fine line between managing people, managing expectations, trying to be friendly, trying to be likable, being a high quality clinical provider, a learner, a failer, like all of these things are all and also make money. Sorry. And then you're also making make money, money. Yeah. With all this. Yeah. And in my case, I've got a couple of other layers where, you know, people ask me questions. I get to be on podcasts like this where they ask me questions about what is it like to be a leader? Because on social media, I have this, you know, I know it all kind of vibe when the reality is I don't know. Shh. You can say it. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah. And so that was on stage. That's what I got to do. I got to do 45 minutes of let me show you what I really don't know. And the reality is a lot of the people that were in the audience, I got a lot of feedback afterwards that they're all in the same boat, but they're like 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years older than me. And they learned some of those lessons the hard way, which I also have learned some pretty deep lessons the hard way over the last two and a half, almost three years, It'll be three years of being a practice owner in August. And I had to do some super deep reflection and the whole kind of 
you know, break apart your personal life because you really are the sum of all of the experiences that you've had and you are the person that you are today because of those experiences and you react and make decisions based on those principles that have, you know, grown you from a small human to the human that you are. So I spoke a little bit about my family and my parents and I are refugees and immigrants from a communist country. So this like stoic personality that nothing phases me, you know, I'll figure it out, say yes and figure it out later was just something that was ingrained in me from when I was so small because, you know, showing mm -hmm. emotion equals showing weakness and mm -hmm. uh, claiming defeat means you're a failure. And, and those were just the core principles that my parents bestowed upon me. And that became the boss that I thought I needed to be. I thought I needed to be the tough one that provided the tough love. Um, the hard liner, the hard like, line, this is always like, right. This is wrong, this, yeah. this is right. You do it my way. And as a hygienist, let me tell you, that was really difficult for my team because it doesn't really matter how we achieve the same result. We're so focused mm -hmm. on these like protocols, right? Seattle protocol, Coise protocol, Spear protocols, all of these, we all love a checklist, but does it matter how we get to it if the result at the end is the same? In my mind, it was no. Like everyone has to do perio the way I do perio. Mm -hmm. And I got to share that on stage, which I was grateful for because, you know, many conferences have a certain a vibe that they go through when they allow people to stand on a podium and speak. And this conference was great because you really got to see a lot of the behind the scenes that KOLs share. And it didn't require a thousand slides. It required 10. And with a picture of all of your toys lined up as a child, yeah. illustrating like who exactly you are deep down. Isn't that crazy? How do you, I mean, I, that was the slide that I'm like, okay, she's going to be on the show. Like I have to <laughs> analyze this human being because uh, not in a weird way or not in a mean way, but I'm not as crazy as you are. Like I'm, I'm a little bit more like <laughs> flexible and things like that, but there's a part inside me where I absolutely identified with that, where as a leader in the hygiene community and in my offices, I had to say, no, this is the only way to do it. This mm -hmm. is the right way. If you're not doing it this way, you're doing it wrong. Now, fast forward a couple of years, you're trying to shake this persona or this identity that people think that you are. You're yeah. like, I'm not that person anymore, but like, that's who you were last year though. So I guess my question is like, how do you shake that? How do you shake that identity of who people think you are? I think and transform. Yeah. I don't think like, it, it doesn't matter to me what people think that I am. I think the most important thing is me knowing who I am mm. and people are always going to have an opinion of you regardless of whether they know you or not. You know, everyone's influenced by outside sources. Someone's chit chatting somewhere and, you know, the tone mm -hmm. is high versus low. And all of a sudden now they don't like you or whatever it is. Right. I, I think that people are going to be influenced by outside sources. So my only important thing is that I am able to live by some new core values and core standards that I am able to make decisions for my team that isn't significantly reflective of the person that I was when I was raised. And I think we all try and like not disappoint our parents. And, you know, my mom used to say that to me when we would go in public, like, don't embarrass me. Like that was the thing that she would, and she would mm -hmm. like squeeze my hand so tight if I did something wrong and give me that death look that I knew that when I go home, I'm, I better run and hide. So it's like this concept of like, don't embarrass my mom or dad. Don't speak before I'm I'm asked to speak or spoken to. Think before I speak. Like all of these phrases, I think in my head, and I'm obviously I'm translating them into from Romanian into English. They sound way harsher in Romanian. But you know, you you kind of have to let all of that go mm -hmm. and realize that everything is a pattern. So in the first year and a half, I had a lot of people quit. I had a lot of people that I fired people that quote unquote weren't a good fit. And I tried, you know, to do the millennial thing and be like, were they the right vibe? You know, giving reasons why it wasn't working out when the real reason was me. I had this concept that I was leader. Everyone needed to follow me. So I need to hire these like little minion Irene's that thought like me, but weren't as strong as me because God forbid they should be as strong as me and step over me and be better than me and produce more than me. And I realized that good leaders train better leaders. 
And the goal for me now is that I have a team that is able to function better when I am not there versus then when I am there, that they can make decisions for themselves and don't require a checklist. And that identifying all of those elements in myself that what I thought was good leadership was not. It was dictatorship. And it's a slow process, unfortunately. And some people never figure it out. Remind me again, you do have a business degree also, correct? Right. Oh, yeah. Business degree. <laughs> so it, it was uh, just, it's law. interesting to think. To, so I, is it, oh, is a law degree? Yeah, political science. So I went to law before oh, hygiene. Okay. Yeah. So I don't have a business oh degree, gosh. but I have a political science I degree. Thought you I thought you were. I thought you, for some reason I thought you would got an MBA or something like that. I wish. Um, I wish. <laughs> so the so the interesting thing is like you, and again this is why I just so identified with what you were saying at VOD. I'm just like this human being is learning all of the lessons in real life, not reading it from a book, a leadership book. Right. But how many times in our lives have we been said, "Hey, read this leadership book. It's going to fix all of your communication skills with the people below you, and you'll be the best leader ever." And everyone thinks that they have to be perfect right. and a perfect leader, but really you don't like you just need to have experience you need to experience heartache and failure and disappointment and good times and awesome times and success and hitting all-time records like you need to have that nice balance of real life experience i don't think i would love for it to be like a prerequisite as you know these hygiene directors or or any sort of like leadership in, in hygiene that you fail enough times like sure. tell me about your biggest failures because yeah. that's amazing and i don't think we talk about our failures enough I think mm -hmm. we make we make them seem like it's this like huge betrayal to ourself and that all of the years that we've been studying and whatever that it's led us to making these big mistakes. And I think that's the true sign of weakness is you're not able to identify some of the reasons why the mistakes happen. And we look at that in, you know, our personal relationships and our, our marriages and our friendships. But then we take business so seriously. Like we don't put them all on the same level playing field. We consider business to be something that has to be super hush hush. And we can't tell people our secrets mm. or our failures or our successes. Cause if we cheer too loud, then, you know, we're going to get the evil eye from someone. But if we're, we don't talk enough, then things are going to fall apart. There's just like this weird philosophy around it. And for women, I think it's even worse because, you know, successful businesses in the eye of the consumers are often run by males. So God forbid you should fail as a woman, then you're failing for all of womankind, not just for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it, it all comes down to history. I mean, when we look at the history of some of the best leaders in the world, and I shared that in the lecture, we're repeating some of these failures that people have made before us. And we're claiming that they're brand new, but they're not. They're like, you know, from mm -hmm. 16th century. And we're not learning from those mistakes. We're kind of repeating them. So I echo what Mark Costas said during his lecture is that he learned really early in his career. He had, I don't know, 16 dental practices or 30 at one point. And the biggest lesson that he's learned is to learn from the mistakes of others. And I didn't do that for the first year and a half. I, I didn't even learn from my own mistakes, let alone from the mistakes of other people, until it got to the point where it was brass tacks. It was costing mm -hmm. me money to make mistakes. And that's where I realized I need to start listening more and speaking less. And sure, people might think that I'm quiet or harder on myself, but the reality is you got to listen more before you can make changes, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, all right. So we're going to switch gears a little bit from like that personal, like touchy feely, like sure. emotional garbage. <laughs> um, so uh, emotional garbage. Right, so okay. I love emotions. I love like this stuff, but like, I, I don't also think the listeners always love it when I talk about this kind of stuff. So okay. my, here's my thing. You're an individual who has, you know, you, you took a, a certain course and then you had to change, you know, direction and change direction multiple times. Mm -hmm. How does someone find out what they're supposed to be doing in life? Because yeah. I feel like we're always changing and evolving. Well, you and I definitely are. And I think yeah. a lot of other people feel stuck somewhere. Sure. I think curiosity is important and risk. Taking risks is something that needs to be learned. And for many people, we live in our lives for, I don't know, however long in your career where you're just, you stay in that one spot and you get stuck in your own day and you're repeating the same day over and over again. And, and this is what, you know, you're referring to. I always took a lot of risks. And I think that, that was one great thing that was bestowed upon me from my parents. One of the many attributes I'd like to say that they shared with me was risk taking. You know, both of them came to Canada with next to nothing, barely spoken English, and it couldn't get any worse. Like that's the the mentality that they had was that it can't get any worse. 
when I was a kid in elementary school and I didn't speak any English and none of the kids would play with me because I was the weird one out and I had a strange name, it couldn't get any worse. So if you make changes, you make changes, obviously, for the better. But hopefully it can't get any worse. Like, can it get any worse than being stuck in a practice that you work in seven days a week or however many days a week and you dread waking up in the morning and you go there and your instruments aren't sharp and someone's like barking orders at you and there's another dental hygienist or dentist or assistant who's like your arch nemesis. Like, can it get any worse than that? No, it can't. So I bopped. I bopped around. I started in perio. Then I went to pedo. Then I did some ortho. I worked in like a high profile cosmetic practice. And I mean, I don't I don't find any of that impressive. I find it sad because it just goes to show how much of a lack of a home I had for the better part of my career. And sure, I acquired skills, but you don't know that when you're doing it. Like you don't realize. Yeah, but why were you bopping though? Why were you going from places? Because I didn't know what I was doing. Nemesis everywhere. No, but I just I didn't know where I fit, and I didn't know where I belonged, and I questioned my skills. And then I would leave, and I would leave, and I would go and work somewhere else, and hope that maybe that was the place that I needed to go to, because everyone that I knew in school, they all had their home. Like some of my best friends still work in the same practices. That when we graduated 17 years ago, my friend Amy and my friend Jessica, they work in the same practices. So I looked at them and they were happy. Shout out to Amy and Jessica. Right. And they were happy and they were content. But were they or did they just coast? That's a really good question, though. That's I guess that's what I've always tried to figure out, like with a lot of hygienists is there are people that just they're content. They just this is the thing. This is the routine. This is what we do. And they coast. That $2 raise or that $1 raise, somehow it's a $1 raise every year. I don't know why it's $1. Yeah. What's the, yeah. like, I can't even afford guacamole that week if I'm, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing is like, do we just get comfortable? And it's like, well, you know, there's no external pressure from the boss to do more, be more, achieve more, earn mm-hmm. more. I'm okay with just clocking in and out and going home at five and not having to bring my work home with me. And that like, there's no wrong answer. Mm-hmm. The question you ask is, are you happy? And do you see yourself doing this for the rest of your life? And if you're not happy and you don't see yourself doing this for the rest of your life, then you need to bop. You need to move around and figure out which of those little things makes you happy. So unfortunately for me, I didn't find an office that had all of these things that I love to do. I didn't find an office that did ortho, perio, pedo, oral myofunctional therapy. I was making good bank. I could control my own hours. I could travel where I wanted to. So I created it. I took the biggest mm-hmm. risk of all, sold our house, bootstrapped selling scrub caps to put down that $100,000 deposit because the bank wouldn't loan me any money. And I took the huge, crazy risk in my early 30s that I could either lose it all or I could achieve greatness. And now I work in a space where I get to do all of those things as much or as little as I want. And now I'm a restorative hygienist too, so I can do the restorative aspect And I wouldn't have known all of those things if I didn't move my butt for the first 10 years of my career and pick apart the things that I love versus the things that I don't love. I want to talk about the restorative aspect. You know how much I love restorative. Okay. So first of all, let's just talk, you know, the ground floor. What are the rules and stuff in Ontario versus Canada versus kind of everywhere else for restorative hygiene Yeah, or restorative, I guess. Every province. What are you allowed to do? Yeah, every province and every state are going to be a little bit different. So I can speak to here because I know here very, very well. I can do everything except prep a tooth. I can't remove or alter enamel. And I can't restore an implant, any kind. I can, you know, replace O-rings and change, you know, little locators on removable prosthesis. But it needs to be checked Mm -hmm. by a dentist who also has to have X amount of hours of implant restorative dentistry. But other than that... I can do anything and everything else. So indirect and direct restorations, cementing crowns, veneers, veneer composite resins, you know, all of the above. Generally, the way that it works in my practice or flows in our practice, if that's like a question that you're probably wondering, like, what does that look Mm -hmm. like day to day? So we run out of two operatories. I've got my own op. Doc has her own op. She's a lefty, so it's really strange. But my (laughs) my room flips so I can my operatory turns from a right to a left operatory pretty easily. Mm -hmm. We don't always do it, obviously, when a patient is in a chair, but we know how complicated (laughs) it is. But generally speaking, she'll come in. I can't numb a patient up. Unfortunately, I can own a practice. I can own my own x-ray equipment. 
I can do restorative, but I can't numb a patient up. I can't prescribe x-rays and I can't diagnose perio or caries, but you know, a conversation. So like, like zero application of like, if the doctor's in there, then you can, or like never, never, never can you? Zero. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Weird. Huh. huh. Okay. And it wasn't until last year or uh, two years ago now that we could treat our spouses. I mean, it's just, we're all over the place. Oh, we're yeah. backwards and upside down. But anywho, so that's kind of what it looks like. Doc comes in, numbs up the patient. Usually, you know, there's a couple of minutes in between, preps a tooth and then leaves. And then, you know, I rubber dam, sectional matrix, whatever technique I'm doing, whatever restoration I'm doing adjust, equilibrate. And then sometimes she comes back at the end. Sometimes she doesn't. Like if it's a small D-O-M-O, then probably not. And that's about it. It's interesting. I'd like to know more about your, the educational process, because this was, you recently went back to and got educated for this, right? I did. I graduated in May. And certified or licensed? How do they, what do they call that? Certified, registered restorative dental hygienist. So my credentials are now RRDH. So you're registered with the College of Dental Hygienists of Ontario. I believe you receive a diploma. So I received a diploma in restorative dental hygiene. So I think there's, yeah, the certified and registered are like interchangeable words, I guess, in that sense. But generally it's registered. So the program was six months which was really tough on me. I had just opened the practice and I applied and then I had to defer. So I deferred because the practice was all over the place. I was Irene kind of 2.0 at that point, uh, a year and a half out of opening my practice, had a lot of changes. I was supposed to start in January. I had to let go of a couple of people in November, didn't rehire, didn't have like a stable office manager. It was just like chaos. So I deferred for a year. And it was a six month program online, two days a week in clinic, one day a week, semestered. And it was really probably one of the hardest times for me to manage the office school full time and be the daughter that my mom raised me and achieve 100 percent in everything. That was tough. Mm -hmm. And then you're also starting from the beginning. So the hardest thing going back into practice is that you are beginning with such little knowledge that your 17 years of dental hygiene equals zero. Like it's, it's not the same. It's apples to oranges, right? Yeah. Your fillings are going to suck. You're going to have an open margin. Your wedge is going to move exactly when it shouldn't move, especially when your light cure is in there. Your matrix is going to have a gap. Your rubber dam is going to fly off in the middle of like all of those things are going to happen. And your 17 years of dental hygiene are not going to count for anything. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's really helped you with your communications and and maybe not communication, but understanding with doctors with, you know, owning a business and also doing restorative, like you have to have some empathy now for the doctors. I do. And you know, I, our recognition has gone up our acknowledgement of what should be restored versus what shouldn't be restored. Since then we've implemented this like disclosing agent on every patient and in intraoral photos using our little mouthwatch camera on every patient before a recall. And we've increased our specific exams as well. Like we noticed that, that you know, when patients come in for their three month maintenance, they're not due to see the doc. If I notice something strange, I'll take a quick snap of it with my disclosing agent. I'll clean it all off and then I'll take another photo of it. So I'm recognizing early carries more. I'm recognizing restorations that are starting to fail early. I understand the mechanics of occlusion a lot better now. So I can identify the path of a tooth. You know, this tooth is a high risk of fracturing because of how much composite is on this like cusp. There's a lot of like little intricacies that I notice a little bit more, but I'm also noticing, you know, defective restorations and our office is relatively new. So we're at this like three so year not mark. You, it's, it's not it's me. Someone else, not, right? That's what you're saying. Instagram <laughs> hashtag not mine. <laughs> no, but like, you know, we're, we're able to watch these restorations a little bit more closely and I can understand what, you know, polymerization shrinkage looks like and open margins or if there's shrinkage to the point where now I can see the cavo surface, uh, I can have those very open conversations with the doc where before I didn't even know what I was looking for. I was like, cool, filling, great. Do you feel like this should be kind of the standard yes. for all? <laughs> Do you really? Yeah. Like everyone should like yeah. this. You know, Washington's like that. Yeah. So I, is Arizona. In school. So is Arizona. Graduate in Arizona with restorative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very, 
it's very, I, I mean, I, for exa- all the reasons you said, it's super helpful for me to be able to communicate with my doctor and my patients yep. the way that that kind of bigger picture, a holistic looking thing is. The only qualm I have with that is that when you're new at a, if, if I was a, a graduated restorative dental hygienist 17 years ago, my experience with dentistry was so limited because I didn't, I wasn't a dental assistant before, or it I didn't work in a practice. Mm-hmm. So I'm already a fish out of water trying to do dental hygiene work. And then you're telling me that I need to do fillings too. I feel like the experience would, I would need a refresher course or I would need a little bit of a boost Mm -hmm. a few, few years later. So I agree that you should graduate with some sort of knowledge or concept of restorative. Maybe it's a workshop. Maybe you're not officially allowed to do a restoration right away, but at least you can identify, you know, the surfaces of a tooth or how a box is prepped or, you know, what a retentive prep is versus a non-retentive prep. And then you can go back into restorative later for this registration or certification. But I don't know if I graduated that long ago, if I would start right away doing fillings. I think I'd be afraid. I mean, it's just like anything else, right? It's the first time that you're, well, I don't know, first time you give an injection, the first time you are doing any skin replanting or laser yeah. or any of the different things. I mean, it's, it, you get used to it. All right. I know your, your time is short. I have a couple more questions though. So maybe this is a, more of a rapid fire thing. Sure. What do you absolutely love doing right now? Like what are the things that, whether it's speaking or traveling or whatever? Icon. <laughs> So there's icon, the icon, thing? A resin infiltration is like my new, new passion over the last couple of years. Um, and it's so interesting that patients don't know that there's like a solution to these white spot lesions. I have some beautiful yeah. cases, like literally patient crying in my chair because she had lived her entire life with these white spots all over her teeth. And, you know, we did Invisalign, straightened clear aligner therapy, whitened the teeth, white spots are even more visible. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, well, I can fix that and it doesn't require drilling and it doesn't require needles or any of that stuff. And it was just like, I don't understand. So, you know, we've had a lot of cases of, of icon and people referring patients to us because they don't perform this procedure. So I would say that that currently is my favorite procedure, a favorite thing aside from social media and speaking, like all of that stuff is great, but it's the procedure time. Like I walk into that operatory. Yeah. I walk into that operatory and it's like the noise is gone. It's just, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm have noise canceling headphones on my brain. (laughs) No, I love that. I've, I've been looking into that for several years. I had one of our pediatric hygienist friends. She was doing it all over the place and she's like, this is the most amazing thing. Yeah. And we just, I couldn't ever get it into my practices. Like they would never allow it to make, this is the best thing. Anyway. Okay. So yeah. what's next? That's the next question. What's next for you? Ooh, what's what's 4.0 look like? Um, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm still working on 3.0. This phase might be a little longer, but um, what's next <laughs> is defining and retaining the team that I have now. So we do this thing at the office every month. We call it the Tooth Life Study Club. And it's a first thing in the morning kind of thing from nine to 11. We block out two hours. I use Spear Education, their like online app and have my team on it. We assign courses to one another and we just talk about the things that we learn and then figure out if it's something we want to implement or not. So I'm really loving that vibe that we have. And now we're working on defining our core values, our personal core values, And then next month, we're going to write our office core values together because I realized that the ones that I wrote don't reflect everyone that's in my practice. So like I was running these interviews with dental hygienists and dental team members, and I was like, our core values are bah, 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 bah. do you agree with them? And they're just like, yes, because they want the job, but then yeah. they're not actually mm-hmm. implementing or making decisions based on those core values. So I scrapped them, literally ripped them up. And now we're going to write them together as a team. So Irene 4.0 that. is inclusive of all of the people in my practice and their decision making. I like that. Yeah. All right. The last question is, what question do you wish I would have asked you that I didn't ask you? <laughs> oh, what question do I And wish also I what's would... the answer to that? <laughs> that question once you figure it out. Um, it's hard. You've been interviewed so many times. I feel like. And you know, just, there is one I mean, question not... that people don't ask. And What's it's that? like, how are you really? Like, how actually are you? Like your heart, your soul, your brain, your mental health. Like you have this public figure appearance to you. You do too. And I think that's one of the questions that we forget to ask one another because we're afraid of what the answer might be. So 
moving forward. Well, also, we don't want to look vulnerable to anybody, right. like even to each other. Like we don't. Now, I, I wouldn't say that you and I are not honest with each other, but we're not the most honest with each sure. other because we are not like in each other's inner circle. Sure. It's just a weird thing. It's like you're like, hey, Andrew, how are you doing? I'm like, holy crap, I am so in the weeds. I'm going to vomit. I'm so nervous yeah. about this. Like you don't want to hear that. and Or maybe you do, but I also don't want to look weak in front of somebody else. So it's And you also right. don't know a, who you can trust. I've learned oh, that the hard way a whole in the last year. Thing in this industry, my yeah. friend. Yeah. So that's one question that you didn't ask. All right. Well, maybe that's the lead into the next time you're on the show. You got uh, it. So you'll be at Chicago Midwinter, which this is going to air next week. You got it. And so make sure that everyone goes and sees you there. Where else can they find you? I mean, you're everywhere, but where else? Social media, uh, Tooth Life Irene on Instagram, and you'll follow the spider web. Fantastic. Thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to my lecture. I appreciate it. Of course. Bye. Peace out, peeps. Yeah, this is a tale. A tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one. Bringing the best of dental knowledge. And we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening. And preventing gum disease. We're going to do a lot of learning. And have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists.